it's not just about behaviors association with health or dis or unhealthy situations and it's not about diseases association with healthy and unhealthy situations it's about how the body system functions with disease and without disease where pain plays a role where stress plays a role and how they all interact in a disease process or a disease free process to create the behavior that we see in the canine let the veterinarians you work with know that you know there's a disease relationship with behavior. They may not know that. Again, you know what you know, I know what I know, but I don't know what you know. And that's important for you to help them know that you're thinking outside the box on this issue. Feel comfortable asking the veterinarian for their opinion. That's really important. Don't be afraid, even if you've gotten roadblocked before, to ask for their opinion. If they're like me, they love to give their opinion. I mean, I'm more than happy to give you my opinion on a number of things. Um, and let the veterinarian know that you are a source of referral to them. That you tell that client, hey, I think there's an issue. You want to see, you want to see your veterinarian. That's very important. To real, they, want to, they need to realize that, it, that, that they're getting a benefit from your questions. And that's very important. No, nobody worth their stuff in small business is going gonna, is gonna to deny that they can't use more business and that they can't use more good business. And if you have a client who's willing to come to see you or wants to see you because they're that concerned, it's very likely you're going to get to do the diagnostic workup you need to do, you know, which sometimes money plays a role there. So I think it's really great if you can do that. Okay? So when we're talking about the frontal lobe of the brain where the sniff center is, you will notice that uh, the animals are unable to recognize a specific stimulus. Uh, they, are, they don't recognize the treat they're being offered that they loved for 15 years or five years or two years or one day. They don't all of a sudden identify the object that they were dying to play with for the most part of their life. Um, and, or their direction is be, that they don't care about directions being requested. They, they don't care what anybody's doing. They're off on their own thing. They also learn the, to lose the ability to reproduce a learned response. Sit, come, stay, the three most simple things. If you have a dog that suddenly can't remember one from the other or has no desire to do any of them, there's probably some disease process going on. It may not be brain related, but there's some other disease process that's affecting that, dog, that dog's ability to do the routine. Time. Now we come to a side issue, which is the partial complex seizure. The partial complex seizure is a very unique event because it's not really a true seizure in the fact that they're not, you know, slobbering at the mouth, falling over, urinating, defecating on themselves, losing consciousness, and, and, and becoming completely non-responsive. They, a lot of times, will be going through their normal day, and all of a sudden they'll stop and they'll look like they're looking at a fly going across the room, and then they'll go off about their business. Or they'll go like, um, they'll, they'll walk over to an onion that fell on the floor that they would never in a million years have eaten, and they'll munch it down like it's an apple. Um, or they will do other things such as suddenly kick a leg out um, or they'll do certain things like suddenly dart from one part of the room to the other or they'll go and they'll touch almost uh, almost like an obsessive compulsive the, the exact same four things in a room every day and these actually can be seizure complexes small areas of the brain they're extremely difficult to find they don't show up on EEGs they don't show up on MRIs and it's very hard you have to kind of basically eliminate everything else, rule out all other factors, and then from a behavioral standpoint only, realize that this is, not, this is not a learned behavioral response, this is not a generalized behavioral response, this is an atypical brain response that's occurring to this animal. <clears throat> so what do we see when we have thyroid gland abnormalities? We see that guy. And why people will have a dog like that and he'll act abnormally, and he'll stand abnormally, and he'll look abnormally, and they let him go until he's either all the way bald or completely, uh, completely mad, as it were, until they finally say, hey, maybe I have a problem. Now, the breeds that are associated with this are our friends here that you see. The two last ones, the Massive and St. Bernard's, you don't find routinely when, it look, when you see these in papers, but I'm guaranteeing you that... Uh, a lot of my colleagues and I have discussed the fact that Mastiffs have a much higher incidence of hypothyroidism, and they have a specific type of hypothyroidism called thyroid, thyroid thyroiditis, which is that their thyroid glands are inflamed, and the immune system sees it as an alien component and tries to get rid of it. And it's a really weird because the numbers are all fine, but the animal has no thyroid to go into the, into the bloodstream or into the cells. This is all, of all the studies I read, this is the only one that actually has percentages. They are, uh, were actually able to track it. 40% of these guys become aggressive at some point in time when they have hypothyroidism. 
Uh, they have altered brain function and they have those petite mal seizures as I talked about potentially. Some, a, lower department, a lower number get fearful, an even lower number become hyperactive. And in most cases with hypothyroidism, they get fat and they get sloppy and they get lazy and their, their hair gets dull and they look kind of crummy. But in 7% of them, they get really active, they eat more, they gain weight, they actually look great. You know, but it's the, it's the calm before the storm. At that situation, I always say recommend that you, they get checked by the veterinarian just so you can rule that out, so you can go forward with your normal behavior modification and make sure it's not hypothyroidism. So we move on to the adrenal gland function. Adrenal glands also are very important to the body. They create the steroids, the two types of steroids, the corticosteroids, which keep us from stressing out totally, which keep our systems in order, which help our immune system in low levels, and the mineralocorticoids, which control calcium and phosphorus and magnesium and all the minerals that our body uses and all the electrolytes that are in our body, especially potassium for heart function. Most of the time we see hyperadrenocorticism, which is an overactive adrenal gland, and that is called Cushing's disease. You may have heard of that. And then there's a hypoadrenocorticism, which is an underactive adrenal gland, and that's called Addison's disease. Early signs, again, are very subtle or non-existent. You really don't see them a lot. Their dog will be a little more nervous or a little more active, a little less responsive to communication, uh, suddenly change his behavior patterns, and it's just a simple change in the way the cortisol levels are. Now, Addison's is not as subtle. When the dog develops an Addisonian component, it can be life-threatening very fast. The dog suddenly becomes lethargic, doesn't want to move. You put your hand on his chest, he's beat, his heart rate's about five per minute. <clears throat> when we're talking about the gastrointestinal system, there are a lot of other components that can be besides parasites. We can deal with medications. I mean, we're a medicine-happy society. We love to give medications for everything. Um, our animals are just as susceptible to over-medication as we are. Uh, irritable bowel syndrome in guard dogs is relatively common, and that's congenitally associated and has to do with, uh, with, an, uh, with an autoimmune component to the, to the small and large bowel in many cases. Again, the pancreas is part of the digestive component and food allergies. Meat is responsible for 70% of the food allergies. That's just the way it is. Chicken for 20% of the food allergies. And gluten is becoming a big suspect now in a lot of this. Uh, there's a lot of, in, of, rea of realization that glutens are bad news. They are tough compounds. The body doesn't know how to break them down correctly. It's not a natural component that we eat. Glutens are byproducts of production of our grains. Um, and it's, been, it's just one of these easy compounds that thickens our sauces and makes things stand up more and gives, it, gives stuff a longer shelf life up to you know, 29 years. Um, and it also has the, <coughs> has the ability to increase the nutrient value in a very cheap fashion. So companies can make their food look more nutritious just by pumping gluten into it. The downside is this stuff is really hard for the body to deal with. <coughs> 